Let me kindly introduce you to the moderator of the session, Marius Ulasas. Marius is the representative of the Institute of Policy Research and Analysis in Lithuania. Marius is active in international development work, especially related to youth participation, citizens' empowerment, intercultural learning. Marius is an expert, definitely, in democracy, in participation issues, cross-sectoral cooperation, acts as an education advisor to the Council of Europe and European Commission. So, dear Maris, the floor is yours to pick up and invite your panel participants and dear guests. Please feel free to ask the questions via slido.com. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's nice to continue this discussion about uh, child-friendly policies, child-friendly approach in general and, and promotion of it. I think it's a very important topic to discuss because I think in Lithuania over 30 years and in Baltics in general, we made major steps uh, towards uh, participatory democracy involving different age groups, but still there is quite a lot of things that we can work on and especially involving very young people, uh, youth and children because still if you would uh, follow narratives in the media in the political debate sometimes opinion of children is viewed as a caprice or is, is more like not really taken seriously but we have this great opportunity to learn from our nordic uh, friends who have been working on the topic quite uh, long years and today we'll have three distinguished uh, panelists uh, in this discussion we have Hjordis from Iceland, we have Birgit from, uh, from Norway and Hannah from Estonia. So we'll have three different examples to see how you friendly and child friendly policies can be promoted, how we can change the view of society, but also of those who are working with decision making processes, how to make them more child friendly so that different parts of society could connect and have the word set and that these words are taken into account. Your this, the floor is yours and we are ready to hear a presentation. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, I had some connection difficulties, so I'm bringing my... Here we go. Can you see my screen? Absolutely. Hello, um, I'm so happy to be here with all of you today um, and thank you for the invitation to tell you about our little project here up in Iceland called Child Friendly Iceland. It's a project that is very close to my heart as child rights have been something that I have been working towards, uh, I feel like, my entire life. <clears throat> so it's a great honor to be able to work on child rights implementation here in Iceland. I want to tell you a little bit about Child Friendly Iceland. It is a project that oversees systematic implementation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child in Iceland and is based on a new strategy and action plan for the government's efforts towards CFC CRC implementation in 2021 to 2024. And it was passed by the parliament actually just now in May of this year. And this is Iceland's first strategy and action plan on child rights. And we have set ourselves some ambitious tasks and goals for these next four years that I'm very keen to be able to share with you here today. At least some of them. Child Friendly Iceland is led by the Ministry of Social Affairs in Iceland through extensive cooperation with other line ministries, NGOs, um, and of course other official identities. The development of the strategy was based on wide-ranging consultations with the Ombudsman for Children in Iceland, the Association of Local Authorities, NGOs, and of course the most important one, children. Around 800 children from all around the country took part in the strategy's development through consultations that were overseen by the Ombudsman for Children and actually reached children all around the country in all age groups almost. And the strategy was actually also shared for open review with the public. The strategy has a very strong basis, of course, in the writings uh, and the recommendations of the UN Committee on the Right of the Child. 
And of, of, of course, the focus has been on the general measures of implementation or the general comment number five, as well as the concluding observations that the committee has provided towards the Icelandic government and the past sessions before the committee. The focus on this first strategy uh, has also been to strengthening the basic structures within the government for systematic CRC implementation with a specific emphasis on building the infrastructure for meaningful child participation, data collection on vulnerable groups and the well-being and rights of children in Iceland, and create the creation and implementation of impact assessments from a child rights perspective. And of course, we cannot assess the impact of, of decisions, of legislation or strategies without having a conversation with the children themselves that the specific action imp impacts. The strategy has uh, 11 main focus areas. Unfortunately, I will not be able to cover all of them here, although I would so gladly deep dive into each one of them and the actions that, are co that go along with each emphasis area here with you today. However, I have chosen two of these areas that well fit with the emphasis of this specific panel and this session. And I would like to tell you a little bit about child-friendly governance and a dashboard on child well-being, as both of these items very strongly correlate with the local level um, when it comes to the implementation of child rights. The Child Friendly Cities project has been a growing steadily here in Iceland for the past five years. And it has a very strong role when it comes to the implementation on the strategy on CRC implementation here in Iceland. It is even named after the initiative. The Child Friendly Cities initiative, as many of you probably know, is a UNICEF-led initiative that supports municipal governments in realizing the rights of children at the local level using the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child as its foundation. It's also a network that brings together government and other stakeholders, such as civil society organizations, the private sector, academia, media, and importantly, children themselves who wish to make their cities and communities more child-friendly. The government of Iceland, with emphasis on the Minister of Social Affairs and Children, has been a strong advocate for the initiative in Iceland, specifically by supporting the project in project implementation through funding, but actually also by strengthening its implementation platform by the Ministry of Social Affairs uh, of the platform by becoming UNICEF's implementing partner in Iceland with the project. And of course, when we're creating a strategy like Child Friendly Iceland or, or any strategy focusing on implementing child rights from the government stage, the local municipalities are of enormous value because of course they are the ones closest to the environment of the children and the ones who have the greatest potential to creating an inclusive open environment when children have the possibility to exercise their rights. And through initiatives like CFCI, Child Friendly Cities, we have the potential to fulfilling the obligation from the national government side down to the local level both creating uh, in increased knowledge and understanding of the practical implementation of the CRC, but also the initiative and the learning environment for children, politicians, adults, and anyone living in a municipality wanting to fulfill the rights of children and increase the well-being of their youngest inhabitants. The partnership between the Ministry of Social Affairs, UNICEF in Iceland and the mun municipalities is therefore mutually beneficial and we have seen some very large steps taken towards CRC implementation on the local level in these past years since the cooperation started. In the Child Friendly Iceland strategy, uh, we have a very strong uh, large part or large section of the strategy is given to the Child Friendly Cities Initiative. And also, when we, ha we had already started to implement our cooperation as, as we were working on the strategy, and we had set the 
goal in, this, in the draft strategy that 50% of children in Iceland should be living in a municipality working towards a child-friendly city recognition by 2024. However, things have been going so well and the interest of the municipalities in Iceland has been so, so um, high that we needed to raise the goal to 80% as we had already reached our goal of 55% of children living in, in a CFCI a child friendly city municipality this year. So now we have a new higher goal of reaching 80% by 2024. And along with uh, being a very important uh, part of CRC implementation from the national government side here in Iceland and the conversation with, and, and a way to co have a conversation with local authorities on CFC implementation. The CFCI, CFCI also serves as an extremely fertile ground for innovation for child rights and child well-being. And of course, just as in any other sector where we are looking towards innovation as the solutions to our future problems and, and the solutions we need for for a new world that is, is coming our way very quickly. We also need innovation for child rights and child well-being. And a strong emphasis of the Child Friendly Cities project in Iceland has been in assessing each municipalities that, that is participating in the projects, their strengths when it comes to child rights and child well-being, and using that strength to support them in innovating new projects with the possibility of being of value for the children and families in that that specific municipality, but also with the potential of being of value for children and families all around the country. And I would like to quickly share with you three examples of how this has given us great results. Through our work with a municipality in, in the capital area in Iceland called Kopavort, we, or they, actually, with the support from UNICEF, developed an app uh, that actually gives children, this is a municipality that actually has uh, iPads uh, for every child in each school within their, their district from the age of 11 to 16. So they developed an app that provides children a platform to have a direct communication with child protection authorities in the municipality. And this was actually a very um, what can you say, like there were a lot of people who thought that this would be a terrible idea thinking there's this myth that if we give children the, put, the power of reporting or having a direct conversation with those in power, they will somehow misuse it. And this has absolutely not been the case. And in the, in the, since the, the story of this app, since it was implemented, we have reached so many cases of children who did not trust the adults around them um, that they probably should have or we would have th thought that they would talk to to report abuse but they actually felt that it was much easier for them to write something in an app than in and saying it out loud to someone and this has given us great results and actually would be a whole another pre presentation if we would go further along into it We've also seen in Iceland protocols for child participation being developed by municipalities like Akureyri on the north coast of Iceland. These are protocols that are led, the development is very much led by the children in the youth councils of the municipality and through their empowerment from being part of implementation of a project like Child Friendly Cities. They have by themselves been instrumental in getting their participants as member of all the main committees of the municipality and also getting their youth council awarded the same respect as any other committee or council within their municipality and being paid for their part in, in that committee just like any other member of, of the, the municipal committees. And lastly, I would like to tell you in the next few slides about a project that we are very proud of and, and we put very much in effort into uh, implementing on a national level now. It's a child well-being dashboard that gives us an overview of all the main data points of well-being in children in a local setting that we are now uh, scaling up to a national level. 
this child well-being dashboard was originally developed in cooperation between the Ministry of Social Affairs, Units of Iceland and Kobovur within the project of child-friendly cities. It has already received an international award from UNICEF in 2019, uh, a child-friendly cities inspire award um, in the category of child-friendly governance. Its framework is based on the founding principles on, of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Articles 2, 3, 6 and 12, and we are now heading for national implementation. Now, what we have been doing uh, on the national level is we have taken the template, the measures, the dimensions of this original dashboard, and we've been mainstreaming it and, and um, implementing it to a, uh, a setting of national environment. The objective has been very much to have comparison of the well-being and rights of children between the regions of the country and for the government to be able to look and compare uh, the different dimensions of the dashboard between municipalities, but also giving the municipalities themselves the tools to look into uh, how things look in other municipalities, creating a platform for sharing information of what is working well and what's not working well and how they can work together to solve these issues, as well as giving the government a better tool to assess its, its operations and actions, specifically in, in the scheme of COVID, where we can look into how the setting is for children in, in different areas of the country and prioritize our funding or our efforts to specific areas. Here you can see uh, a preliminary structure of the dashboard. We are, as, as, actually, as we speak, still working on um, Re, uh, reworking it with uh, academia, our academic partners and, and um, ombudsman for children and also have been running it through a consultation with children around the country with the support of the ombudsman for children in Iceland. And here you can see the five main dimensions that we have been working with and they are education, equity, health and well-being, safety and protection and then violence and negligence. And each dimension has a subdivision sub that then has uh, a few uh, measures compartmentalized in each subdivision. And this actually dashboard is collected into an index that we control and collect through a software that's actually open source and it's called Nightingale. And here you can see how Nightingale operates here in the right lower corner, you can see the dimensions that I showed you earlier, equity, security and protection, education, health and well-being and social participation. And you can see how these dimensions actually, if you have the system, you can actually drill down into each of these dimensions and you can compare different regions of the country, but you can also drill down further and you can look into the specific dimensions or the index as a whole and compare regions and also smaller municipalities. So um, this is, is actually the end of, of the presentation for me. I wish I could go into more uh, detail with you and share more information about this strategy, but we have set ourselves some very um, high goals and we intend to be at the at 2024 to have implemented them. We hope so, that's what we're striving for. Uh, I haven't been able to tell you uh, very much about our, our main emphasis on child participation, but I would like to share with you that we are starting work on actually building a child participation platform, allowing children to have uh, to, to bring issues towards the government, as well as the government bringing issues and, and asking for children's opinions uh, on different things that we're working on, legislation, strategies, etc. We're also starting work on, on child rights impact assessments that are to be implemented across the government in the next few years during the strategy uh, time period. But we've also been strengthening our data collection effort as we have seen in the work we've been doing with the dashboard that often we lack information about specific groups of children, specifically the younger children, children of foreign origin and children with disabilities. And and lastly, we're working towards efforts of increasing knowledge of child rights and how they should be put into the context of those working for and with children, taking it from being the map on, on the wall or, or these legal texts and bringing them closer to the people who are actually involved with the child in the setting in their everyday lives, but also the children themselves. 
that's of course the foundation for anything that has to do with implementing child rights. Thank you. That's the last for me. Thank you, Gordis. Thank you for your really broad overview of uh, what you are doing with uh, young people <laughs> and children in Iceland. Um, I think I, I will keep the questions for, for the end of the discussions, but I think the most important aspect, you know, to see what is what has changed, what kind of impact this participation brought, because, yeah, you're mentioning that you have much better overview, people, young people know their rights, you have much better knowledge of young people's situation across the country, but also, you know, the sense of engagement the sense of belonging, understanding that, okay, well, we are important despite our young age. So it, it has a lot of also intangible effects on young people, but also in society as such. And let's move to the second example, second, uh, second presentation. And uh, I would like to welcome Birgit Lervik from, from Norway, from the Norwegian Directorate for Education and Training, to speak about what they do in Norway related to children and youth participation, but also to look broader from the perspective of cross-sectoral cooperation, so how to engage different organizations and institutions and to coordinate their efforts in this field. Birgit, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, now you can see my presentation. Uh, you can also hear me. Yes. I hope. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present uh, our work with the Zero 24 uh, project. Uh, Uh, Zero 24 uh, is uh, maybe a bit mysterious uh, title. Uh, it denotes the target group of uh, the project, uh, the project uh, which is uh, vulnerable children and young people from the age of zero uh, to 24 years of uh, age. Uh, it also denotes uh, two uh, projects, uh, both a Norwegian project uh, and a Nordic uh, project. Uh, the main goal of uh, both these uh, projects uh, uh, were to improve cross-sectoral collaboration for vulnerable children, adolescents, and their families. Uh, in this presentation, uh, I will mainly use the experiences from the Nordic uh, Zero uh, 24 project. Uh, this project was initiated uh, by the Nordic uh, Council of Ministers as an effort uh, to reduce the dropout rate from secondary education and to prevent subsequent marginalization. Uh, and it was a strong focus, as I said, on cross-sectoral uh, collaboration for uh, improved uh, services. Uh, both Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland and Iceland, as well as Greenland, the Faroe Islands and Åland, uh, participated uh, in the project. Uh, the Nordic countries are uh, similar in many respects, but also uh, different, which made it very interesting uh, to have this opportunity to learn from each other. So that was an important aim of the project, that we could benefit from each other's experiences uh, uh, through it. Uh, the project management was part of the Norwegian Director for Education and Training, and it was a Nordic uh, project team with representatives from all the participating uh, countries. Uh, each participating country had their own national project. Uh, these projects uh, were mainly municipal initiatives, uh, which means that the people taking part, uh, for a large part, were people from the first line, people working in the municipalities and in the services. Uh, the participants met approximately twice a year to report from their work and to share experiences. Uh, as I said, the national projects uh, were different in many respects, uh, but uh, they had to share the same challenges and also the same goal. I just want to show you a very short film uh, to sort of illustrate uh, this. Uh, 
i en kommun, i ett fylke, i en region, i ett land med många direktorater och departementer, bor Stian. Han går i femte klasse och har varit en del borte fra skolan i det sista halvåret. Läraren har noterat att Stian kanske sliter med nå. Efter att ha snakket med Stian och föräldrarna hans och någon av de andra lärarna kommer de fram till att det er behov för hjälp fra någon utanför skolan. Det finns många gode hjälpare. Det kan vara aktuellt med bistånd fra både hälsosöster, barnvärn, pedagogisk psykologisk tjeneste eller barn- och ungdomspsykiatrin. Efter vart som Stian blir äldre vill han också kunna få tillbud fra rådgiver på ungdomsskolan och uppföljningstjänsten, navvägleder eller skolpsykolog på vidaregående. Det er mange som kan hjälpa Stian og familien hans, men det kan være länge å vente, og hjelperne har ofte mye å gjøre. Og hvem har egentlig ansvaret? Stian blir sendt fra den ene tjenesten til den andre. Det mangler ikke på kartleggingsskjemaer, samtaler, tester, vurderinger, veiledere, retningslinjer, brosjyrer, rapporteringssystemer og diverse tiltak og projekter. Dette tar tid, og ingen har full oversikt, for det er for mange som ikke snakker sammen. Barn og unge som har det vanskelig sliter ofte med flere ting samtidig. For å finne gode løsninger må tjenestene samarbeide med Stian og familien hans, og med hverandre. Ved å snakke sammen kan vi se hele Stian og de ressursene han har i livet sitt. Slik kan Stian få den hjelpen han trenger. Det er fint for Stian og familien hans. Det er fint for dem som gjerne vil se at det nytter å hjelpe Stian. Og det er fint for oss alle. Yes, uh, I hope you could both see and hear uh, the film. Uh, as I said, these were uh, the same. These were the challenges and also the goal uh, of the, all the uh, local projects uh, in the in the Zero Twenty Four uh, project. Uh, the project was uh, followed by researchers, uh, and uh, they wrote three reports from the project. This is the final report, is available uh, online in English. Uh, and my presentation uh, is mainly based on uh, uh, some findings from this uh, report. As I said, the national uh, cases were uh, different. Uh, uh, related to whether they involved, uh, some of them were broad municipal development processes related to building better structures and systems for coordinated follow-up. Others were more narrow and were about developing new approaches and methods. And some again were about uh, making integrated services organized in one-stop shops, interdisciplinary teams, uh, etc. Uh, all the projects uh, were based or had as their vantage point the educational sector that uh, all involved cross-sectoral cooperation. All had a their aim uh, to develop a better follow-up of children, young people and their families. And all of them had an ambition to put the child and the young person, maybe their families, in the center and develop the services uh, based on the client's uh, needs. Uh, this became evident uh, rather early in the project that uh, this uh, uh, ambition to put the child at the center of attention uh, was uh, something the project uh, shared and connected to uh, this uh, holistic approach, uh, sort of trying to grasp the whole life situation of the child or the family is connected to two other factors, and these are interrelated. The other factors uh, is early intervention and uh, this more coherent uh, follow-up. Uh, when you put uh, the child uh, or the family uh, at the center uh, and take their, their whole life situation into account, uh, when their whole life situation uh, become uh, more evident, you see also uh, more clearly the need for uh, early intervention. You need you see uh, it's easy for you to see how important it is to make the services available uh, when the child needs them, and in a way uh, that is uh, 
so it's easily accessible for the child or the family. Uh, that uh, you might need to lower the threshold to get access to the service, or you, uh, it might be important uh, to provide the service, for example, in the everyday life uh, in the school. Um, there are a lot of examples of this uh, in the different cases uh, of this kind of uh, service provision and early intervention. Uh, this is also uh, about moving from a focus on my service, my tasks, my responsibility versus yours, uh, and to become more concerned about uh, the big picture and how we together can give the children and families uh, what they need to master their own lives in a good way. Uh, this means you need to stop uh, your shifting responsibility to say that well, this is not my responsibility, this is your responsibility. Uh, and instead, you really try to figure out uh, how we can uh, join forces uh, to do this work uh, together. Uh, all the services tend to see their area uh, of responsibility. Uh, and it's a well-known problem that no one's responsible for the whole picture. The ones, uh, the only ones often uh, who can sort of uh, see the whole picture is the child or the family themselves. Uh, and it's not, it's, it's hard for them to sort of uh, make the services take this uh, perspective. Uh, so, with a more coherent follow up and this uh, cooperation uh, is very important uh, to empower and really help children uh, and families. Uh, at the same time, it seems uh, hard for us, it's hard for us to succeed in cooperation. Uh, uh, why? Uh, Cross-sectoral coordination implies that the different sectors, agencies, institutions, services, disciplines, and or professions involved in the process of collaboration to achieve better coordination of their efforts with the aim of solving a joint problem or reaching a joint, a joint uh, uh, goal. Uh, as I said, this is challenging. Uh, there are several reasons why it's challenging. Uh, one important reason is the way we have organized uh, our services. This organization do not facilitate uh, cooperation. The systems are established to deliver specialized services and to report on these one by one according to their area of responsibility. Uh, this also shapes the culture and the way uh, they think. Uh, the researchers use the term the institutional logic uh, to describe uh, how the services tend to focus on their own responsibilities uh, and how the service you work in affect what you're looking for and thereby which challenges you see. The different services with their different responsibilities, different mandates, different tasks also have uh, specialized uh, professionals uh, within education suited to the task. All this also forms the professional culture, the norms and values, uh, and contributes to this uh, specific institutional logic. So each uh, service uh, tends to have their own way of uh, thinking, of understanding challenges and understanding solutions. And they sort of see uh, the world uh, through their uh, special glasses from their sector. And the challenge uh, is to get out of these and be able to see a broader uh, picture uh, also. It doesn't mean you should stop being specialized and professional, but you need to be better to understand how your contribution fits into a broader uh, picture. And putting the child uh, or the family at the center of attention uh, is an effective way of overcoming this uh, institutional logic. Uh, when the services get together and see uh, more of the whole situation, it's also easier for them to see their part mm -hmm or contribution in it, and uh, this whole picture also uh, provides a platform for uh, cooperation and a more coherent uh, follow-up.
uh, cooperation and cooperation demand a rather different approach, uh, and it's not something that will happen uh, automatically. It demands uh, work uh, over time. Uh, FAFO uh, uses this figure uh, from uh, the Norwegian Agency for Public Management and Government, just uh, modified it a, a little. The point of the figure is to show uh, cooperation as a process that you need to work uh, systematically at each step, from having structures for sharing information to actually working together to develop shared plans uh, and actions and uh, eventually also implement these new practices as a way uh, of working. Uh, the figure uh, can also help you uh, to see what level of coordination or cooperation you need. In some cases, uh, information, the sharing of information might be enough. In other cases, uh, you need to, sh to establish a shared understanding of the situation, maybe to uh, prevent destroying each other's efforts, or maybe you need to take you know, to make a joint effort to uh, reach stage four or five. The figure also shows that you cannot get to the higher stages uh, before you have been to the lower, so you need to climb uh, the staircase. Uh, it also takes time to establish uh, these new practices uh, and you move up and down the staircase uh, several uh, times. For example, it will be uh, necessary to re-establish a shared problem understanding several times uh, as situations are changing and as the new people uh, get into, new people join the service. So, uh, cooperation cannot just be uh, decided on. Uh, it needs dedicated work uh, over time, and there are several factors important uh, to succeed. Uh, in the report, the researchers describe uh, several such uh, factors in depth. I'll just mention a few uh, here. Uh, proximity seems uh, very simple, but uh, you actually need to get together, you need to establish shared arenas, you need to establish structures so that people can meet with each other and with the child and the family. Uh, and they need to talk and really work on developing a shared and really uh, good <laughs> uh, understanding uh, of the situation uh, and the challenges. You also need to have knowledge about the other services. You need to know uh, what their contribution uh, and role is and what they can do. Uh, this is something also that takes time and develops over time from the experience from working uh, together. Uh, the researchers uh, says that this is also about uh, changing the culture in a rather fundamental uh, way. The researchers describe it as a relational term. Uh, that you need to realize the importance of good quality cooperation and relations, both with the children, uh, young people, parents, uh, and the other services. Uh, both individuals need to develop cooperative skills and relational competence, but this is also the capacity we need to sort of build into our system over time and in a systematic uh, way. That was uh, my presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Birgit. Uh, uh, I think with cross-sectoral cooperation, everyone agrees that we have to do it. It's inevitable. We have to put our efforts together. But usually the main issue is who should start it, you know, who really feels desperate or who is brave enough to reach out to other organizations and institutions. And very often, at least in Lithuania, in case uh, our public servants are stopped by idea that what if we fail so maybe you know let's stay safe let's not try maybe we fail but why not to uh, swap it around and think but what if we will succeed and then only in this way we can bring this uh, new opportunities uh, and for me I I'm working a lot with, uh, with Norwegian youth organizations youth institutions and it was great to see that, you know, based on UNG data, on the research of young people, you realized that youth participation directly affects mental health of young people, well-being. And then public health or Folkehelse 
became proactive in this field. I think, yeah, everyone should be involved. And and I think it was really a nice transition from youth representation into youth participation in different areas, in different topics. And maybe you could just shortly react which sectors uh, of public policy are easiest to involve, which are most difficult to get on board. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can only answer for Norway, and uh, actually we uh, did a a small, uh, we had some uh, researchers uh, 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 look into this for us. So uh, they asked all leaders of all services and all municipalities in Norway, from three, four years ago, about uh, this and other questions. And what was very interesting was that all the services said that we are easy to participate with, and we really want to participate with the others, but the others are very difficult to participate with. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I can hear there is some, I can hear an echo on my voice now. But, yes, a bit. So, uh, yeah, so uh, I think it's not, as you can see from my presentation, this is not rocket science. As you also said to me before, uh, it's rather easy to understand and to see, uh, but it's really hard to actually make it happen. And I think that's uh, because it, it's hard to make it happen in practice, uh, because it demands a rather, a rather different way of uh, organizing things, uh, thinking, seeing, uh, yeah, uh, which is, yeah, as we all know, hard. And, but, but what we also have seen that if you really put the child in the center and you really try to see things from their perspective, the cooperation also is much easier. If you can have focus on, on the child and the situation that you're trying to solve and sort of forget a little bit the service perspective, things become easier. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And it's also a broader question, you know, how far do we take the opinion on board of young people? Because again, all the research in Norway shows that young people in schools would like to kick out all Nor- old Norwegian from the school program, but are we going there? Maybe not. But let's see how Estonians are dealing with it. Uh, I would like to present Hanna Tseviova from, from Estonia, from Ministry of Social Affairs. She's head of Department of uh, Children and Families. What do you do in Estonia? Because you now, Lithuania is always looking forward, okay, looking north, north, and we're looking what Estonians are doing. Please share some of the examples with you. Thank you. We are also looking up to the north, so it was nice to hear Iceland and uh, Norway uh, examples as well. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I guess I can uh, fulfill the proximity factor and be here in Vilnius. Uh, So... Uh, let me see. Yep, it works. Uh, only I cannot see it from uh, here, but I think we can manage with the big screen as well. Um, so, as I could hear from uh, the presentations from Iceland and Norway, then actually we have quite similar challenges. And also our ideas are going to the same direction as well. So some of the things you could already hear from the previous presentations, but uh, I will tell you about them anyways and maybe just shorten my presentation a little. So I would also like to give you three examples of, so to say, child-friendly governance. And as we have a lot of data and digital possibilities, Uh, to make use of this data, then I would like to share examples of how to use this data in order to make better policies for children and families. So, firstly, I'd like to also give you an example of uh, how we nudge the Estonian local municipalities in order to be more child-friendly. So, Minu Omavalitsus, the direct translation is My Municipality, is um, an initiative of the Ministry of Finance uh, in Estonia. It is a website where you can find different dashboards that show how well are Estonian local governments executing their tasks and what is their public services, accessibility and quality. 
And uh, similarly to Icelandic example, it is also a tool for, first of all, local governments in order to support their strategical planning and governing, including child-friendly governing. And of course, it's also a tool for residents in order to give information and also to empower them in being a more equal and demanding partner to the municipality. Um, so we gather uh, data uh, from different registers, but also regularly from uh, local government service and satisfaction survey in order to receive the data needed for the dashboards. And here is one example uh, of the dashboard. So, of course, there are very many tasks that the local governments have to fulfill. Uh, starting from environment, transport, etc. And child well-being is one of them. So uh, we have categorized them into 16 services and hundreds of specific indicators. And they are all rated in a five-point scale. So if now the technicians help me, then I can show you actually a similar picture as was shown uh, by Hjördis from Iceland, where you can see the different dashboards showing how well different municipalities are doing in different fields. So if uh, you click on uh, one of the municipalities on the map, then you can go more into detail. And there are very different criteria that you can also check individually. Uh, for example, how accessible different services are, what level of quality the services have, also if there are enough specialists, what is the level of education of the specialists. And um, I can also show you another dashboard. So this is also in English. Here you can see the satisfaction of residents of certain municipalities. And it is quite interesting to, for example, compare the satisfaction of the citizens to the accessibility to different social services, for example. Quite often, surprisingly, we have seen that it is not always uh, connected. And for us, it's also information about that we maybe should do more so that citizens uh, should be should be aware of what are their rights and what services, for example, they should receive from the local municipalities. And now we can go back to the presentation. And as here we can see more the macro level indicators, then at the same time, uh, it is also important that the local municipalities um, have self-assessment tools. So I will show you another one. This is a health and well-being profile. And uh, the module of children and families well-being is part of the profile. And this is mandatory by law for all municipalities on the regional level or on the county level to uh, fulfill and use this profile. So it's being renewed at the moment. So here I show you uh, not the best visuals, but uh, here you can still see how this profile works. So this is more a tool for the local municipalities to assess their strengths, uh, their weaknesses, and uh, by that they can plan their strategies and budgets. Uh, so yes, here is one example of the demographic situation. Uh, but as you could see from the previous slides, it's quite similar to uh, what uh, Hjördis showed about Iceland, that there's indicators about safe environment, health and inclusion, education, different services for children and families, etc. And so some of the data is automatically imported from different registers, but a lot of the work needs to be done by the municipality themselves in order to analyze and figure out what they should do better next year or the forthcoming years, for example. 
So um, this is actually similar to uh, uh, this uh, Norwegian uh, project uh, uh, because um, a year ago we initiated a reform of integrated support system for children with special needs. And by special needs, I mean children who need complex support from either health, educational or so social sector. And um, just a very quick overview, uh, the aims also quite similar to the Norwegian example. So we want to develop a support system that enables to detect risks as early as possible, simplifies the route to help and endures needed support measures and quality services. So we previously did uh, or conducted many studies, interviews with parents, etc. And uh, one of the main things that they said is problematic for them is that the support system is so uh, fragmented that they do not know where to get the help or what rights they have or what sector is responsible for what service. And they have to apply for so many or um, uh, how to say it, submit applications and so most of their time goes to bureaucracy instead of helping their child. So this is something we want to change and one of the aims is to develop automatic journeys for those children. For example, quite often we know that a child is going to be born with very severe health problems. We know that this child may never go to a regular school, may need um, certain services, etc., etc. So why we make this parent, then when the child is born, seek for the information by themselves if the state actually already knows what should be done for this family and for this child. So we are developing these automatic journeys, we call them. And also, of course, as I saw from the video from Norway, um, I think the um, common challenge for all of us is the um, um, enough of specialists. There's always lack of them. And when we started looking into uh, the specific things that the specialists working in either health, educational or social fields are doing in Estonia, then it turned out they are doing a lot of uh, paperwork and duplicating uh, things. And this is also true for different assessments and evaluations. So this is something that we try to combine as well to support the integrated evaluation and also service provision. So what we did is that we picked or actually made seven personas uh, and we designed journeys for them based on user experience. So I show you here the seven personas. These are not real children, but these are the um, typical problems that children could have. And uh, these personas actually cover most of our target group that we are dealing with. Um, of course, the profiles were a lot longer. Uh, this report came out just a week ago. So if anybody's interested, I can share it with you. It's in Estonian, of course, unfortunately, but still uh, maybe of uh, help. Um, but here you can see overall what type of personas we, um, we made. And uh, during the whole summer, there were um, working groups going coming together. Uh, parents, different specialists, uh, were all discussing about what is wrong in our current system and what kind of journeys to help they would like to have. So we had a service designers team who helped us. And I will show you one example. So the first boy on the picture, Rasmus, um, he is already born with, uh, as I mentioned earlier, very severe health problems. And uh, let me see. Uh -huh. Yes, it's working. I know you cannot see anything from these pictures, but it's in Estonian anyways. So this 
first bigger picture is, I think, only one tenth of the actual uh, journey. So what we did was, and this is the first boys, Rasmus's journey. Um, we uh, um, mapped the whole uh, journey or route of the kind of children as Erasmus. And uh, after that, we designed a new route for this kind of uh, children. And we could see that we can skip tens of not necessary evaluations, uh, different applications. Uh, we calculated how much time uh, or specialist time we can free uh, from this bureaucracy and uh, um, use it now in order to provide real services for children and families. So this journey here, the pictures you can see, we looked at um, what should be changed and what different specialists and sectors should do in the future for these kind of children. And there is a huge package of different uh, IT developments and how the data should move in order to support this one-stop shop idea that Birgit was also talking about. Um, yes, so we know that this reform will take many years, but we have already started with some of the changes that will come into force already uh, next year. And uh, last but not least, uh, just a couple of slides. Um, I wanted to show you another uh, project that is going on in Estonia right now. It's called Life Event Services. So it's an instrument that fosters seamless government governance. And what it means is that um, uh, an event service complies several services related to the same event into a single service for the user. So um, almost every people experience certain events during their lifetime. For example, they get married, they establish a business, they have a child, someone close one dies. And quite often this event is connected to very different activities managed by very different ministries, agencies, etc. And again, this person has to go behind very different doors in order to then receive either help or manage this life event. So one of the... Yes, first of all, I should mention that uh, we mapped, uh, I think it was 14 different events that usually every person uh, experiences during their lifetime. And one of the first life event services to be now fully redesigned and developed is having a child life event. And there are currently 12 public services related to having a child from the res registration of the pregnancy to the family benefits provided by seven different public sector organizations. And so just uh, one picture, uh, to visualize it, um, the idea is that the parents only need to do maybe one click and they don't need to know what goes on in the back office. So this picture here, again, sorry, in Estonian, shows only this data that is connected to pregnancy. And you see how many different actors there are. Uh, and so when you think of uh, birth of a child, you can maybe uh, not only duplicate it, but put a zero behind it. And there are so many actors. Um, and uh, we try to, yes, simplify it uh, for the new parents. I will not show you the video here. I think this is something you can later on check out. Uh, this is a very short version in English. It doesn't give the overall idea, but still something. And maybe I can add to those who maybe watch the video later that the idea is that not only you can 
before the child is born, already put the name, uh, choose the benefits you wish to have, uh, receive proactive, uh, uh, mm, yeah, now I forgot the word in English, never mind, but we try to also combine different services already. So, for example, the parent doesn't uh, have to go and apply for a kindergarten place by him or herself, but this proactive offer is made to the parent. So, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Hannah. Who have you, so many things I would like to react to, but I uh, said we don't have too much time, but I really hope that you, are only, you also suggest the possible names to the parents. Because <laughs> it's one thing to register the name, but to choose the name, that's the most complicated part. And also looking at your presentation, we already know that, uh, at least in the youth policy field, Estonians have most research per capita in the world, most probably. So you really like data, collect data, and to know the situation. So one of the added value of uh, children participation, youth participation, is much better understanding, right? So we so saw dashboards, you know, from you, from uh, from Icelandic uh, perspective. So you have much better understanding what is happening with young people or with children in general. But I would like to ask this question to all three ladies uh, who presented their um, examples. What is the added value of children participation? Why should we bother? Yeah, so from like public sector perspective, we know much better how what are the needs, how to manage the resources. And it was also a perfect example from Hannah saying that investing into participation, investing into research, we save so much money later on because we know what is needed and we can maybe uh, make some processes automatic. But in general, what are the other added values of children and youth engagement or early engagement into decision-making? Who would like to react? Mm, I can say something about it. Uh, uh, we have, I think, uh, only recently started to take this seriously. Uh, so I have some experiences from two or three projects uh, where we have done this, smaller or larger projects. And what uh, has happened in all instances is that, I must admit, I'm thinking that, okay, we need to do this. Uh, I think I know from this, I think I know from this call what kind of information we will get. So it feels to me, maybe it's not so necessary, but it's politically correct, so let's do it. <laughs> and when we do it, it always provides information that surprises me. So it's always uh, something coming up that's surprising and new and something else than we get from the usual uh, participants, the uh, adults. That's my experience. Mm. Thank you, Birgit. I would just also clarify a little bit when we talk about the project in Norwegian perspective. Usually it's three years initiative, some kind of innovation in a public field, and then either it continues or sometimes also not, but also it's a nice way to try out different approaches. Here this, what's from also young people perspective, we didn't talk mm -hmm. too much from youth and children perspective, what added value mm -hmm. it gives to them? I mean, I, I sit here doing the work that I do because I was able to work in child participation as a young child with the first ombudsman for children. It had such a huge impact on me to, give, to be given the possibility to speak my mind, to have an impact and to see adults, people, adults in positions of power listening to me and, and thinking that my voice was of value, that it actually spearheaded me into a career that I probably wouldn't have had it into before. And I think the voices of children and young people, as soon as we change the perspective of those actually making the decisions and opening up the space for children and young people, they actually, uh, you can see it happening in their mind when they start having those conversations. They can see immediately, I've seen politicians a few weeks before election sitting down with these huge consultations with children and young people with dollar signs like votes in their eyes because they're getting such great feedback and ideas for projects for the community just by talking, sitting down and talking to children. And also the, the things that they're asking for and the things that they want to change, they're usually not that complicated to change. And one thing that I would like to just mention, I think it's, it's something that we really 
rarely discuss or, or look into. It's like the adult perspective only reaches like, you know, we are 1.60 centimeters tall. Children are like average size of a child is like 120 meters or so. So we just don't see our environment. We don't see the world the same way as they do. And as soon as we lower ourselves down and look at the world from their perspective, it just looks totally different. And we need that perspective to create good service for children and also just raise children who feel like they're part of society. It's not rocket science. It is. Thanks a lot. Even though very often you cannot really look down at young people because they are so tall nowadays. Huh? <laughs> Hannah, yeah. what's that as well? <laughs> I think especially when I talk about uh, policy development, then we always want to achieve outcomes. And I think that if, for example, we want to achieve a change in youth delinquency, then if we don't ask what works for youth themselves, then it could be just a waste of money and time. And I can give you an example of the same reform of uh, children with special needs that I uh, uh, talked a little uh, about earlier. We mainly uh, involved uh, parents and asked them what they think that should uh, work better for the children and what would you need. But uh, with uh, one profile or persona, we actually gathered information both from youth, from the children and from parents. And it turned out that teenagers didn't at all want the same route as their parents thought that is best for the children. So if we wouldn't involve children, then we have made a totally wrong route for them and no outcomes then. Thanks a lot for, for these points. I mean, it's as simple as that. If you want to know what we, what we want, stop guessing, start mm -hmm. discussing. And mm -hmm. it's really, it saves a lot of time and energy. And yes, at the beginning, maybe you need to build a trust. Maybe when we, we checked uh, with youth participation, it doesn't really need uh, more resources, but it needs to change and adapt a little bit policymaking processes because with young people, you need a little bit more time. You cannot say, okay, we're submitting the strategy tomorrow. What do you want? No, you need to build trust. You need to ensure that actually they understand what are you talking about, to talk in a youth-friendly, child-friendly language, but also to show them that their opinion will really affect the decisions. And yes, yeah, sometimes it takes time from you know expressing your opinion to the decisions and to see them in a tangible way. But we have to build this trust because we're not not—we're talking about the society. We're not talking about one, one day. So, guys, thanks a lot for your examples. Thanks for your input. Continue doing a good job. And those who are still doubting, shall we involve young people or children into decision-making, stop doubting and start involving them from tomorrow. Thanks a lot. All the best uh, to everyone here. And bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Ava. Well, so let me join probably Marius and uh, and still our guest for the last remarks. Really, I was so impressed. Uh, it, it's lovely to have these uh, partners and the uh, um, country members with whom we can learn as well. Thank you for a wonderful presentation still here inside and the ladies um, far away out from there. So my time and our time today is over. Now, I just would like to... Uh, say thank you for all the participants for our roller coaster journey today. It was not easy, right, with all the coffee breaks in between. But we all will see each other tomorrow, 9 a.m., back here with the live participants in the hall and virtual participants joining us with the same link which you used to join today. So just thank you once again and uh, see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>